start it off. Um, you, Professor Kelsey, you were talking about the public union um, case that came out today. It, previously, it seemed like uh, Justice Scalia had sort of respected that right to have to pay the fee that he felt in free riders. But what, is there a particular reason you think he would have been the, the vote overturning that? Well, I think over time, he, he probably, you know, it's interesting because there are cases in which Scalia came in early on and said, well, here's the precedent, uh, you know, gosh, I guess I'll live with it. And, you know, he even wrote a case in the 80s, in his early years, overturning a death sentence on a theory that he later rejected as completely unsound. Um, you know, so I, I do think, you know, as the justice progresses, their views on these things may change, and when, early on at least, they may be more reluctant. So a new justice, I think that's another good point. No matter who it is, is going to be reluctant to leap into a big issue and say this whole thing is wrong and has to be overturned. But over time, as the justice gets more comfortable, I think they kind of figure out the principles they want to adjudicate by, and I just don't think he... He did not like the idea of compelled speech, and, and basically that's how he would have viewed the union setting that these people were sort of being forced, if you will, to fund things they didn't want to fund. And I'm pretty confident he was the fifth vote to, to go the other way on this one. Looks like you agree as well. Well, I mean, there's different views about Scalia. Um, I've often argued with Lou Mulligan uh, in his office over <laughs> Scalia. We were Scalia watchers for a while. Um, because, you know, some people, and there actually has been evidence come out to support one view, which is that Scalia did always imagine, for reasons that some outside observers thought were strange, that he was going to be Chief Justice. And when it didn't happen, some people think he radicalized, and that he became much stronger and fervent in his views. Um, I'm on the other side of that. I actually think he's, he's always had strong views, it's just sometimes he needed to figure out exactly what he thought, and sometimes coalitions formed differently. Um, but a lot of his opinions that were quite strident, like Lawrence v. Texas, right, his dissent, that was pre-Roberts being appointed. So it's not like that either theory is a good explanation. But I do think it's true that Scalia was, you know, I mean, I, I think his dissent in the Arizona immigration case uh, was crazy, uh, in my mind. Finding this idea that states have sort of a sovereignty that predates the Constitution seemed very anti-originalist to me, very outside of, of the other cases they decided before, but that's, you know, anyone with a long legacy is going to have departures. And generally, you know, I think among conservatives, there's been a fear that they all drift to the left, right? And with Scalia, maybe there was a slight drift to the right, I don't, I don't know. But um, yeah, I mean, he was on the court for so long, of course he changed. And I absolutely agree that in the union case, he, he, he made his views pretty clear. So. Yeah, there was an early, when he got on the court early on with the 11th Amendment and the immunity of the states, he wasn't quite sure because he had competing values. Uh, so if you read the text of the 11th Amendment, it does not remotely do what the court has over time said it does. And being a textualist, that troubled him. Uh, and so early on, he said, I'm not sure what I think about these cases that expand the 11th Amendment. But eventually, he joined that train and was fully on board and always voted for the states in the 11th Amendment cases. So you know, I think with any justice, first of all, never expect complete consistency. None of us are consistent all the time. Uh, but there's also a difference often between a justice's early career when they first get on the court and they're trying to sort through all this and then as they sort of get comfortable and their ideas mature, maybe a very different person later on in their tenure on the court. I mean, I would say of federalism issues generally, there's only been two consistent justices. Thomas, who generally thinks the federal government should lose, and Breyer, who thinks the federal government should win. And everyone else, is, depending upon whether it's Lopez, Morrison, Comstock, Raich, they were all over the map. I mean, the level of consistency to broad principles or doctrines is quite low among most of our justices. Before, so I, I clerked for White actually shortly after Kennedy had come on the court. Um, so he was about 87, 88. I mean, it took a while that because you know there were two nominees and he was the third one. But Kennedy was present when I was there. Yeah. What are your general feelings? I guess you know from your experience working with them, like they not like these types of big holdups, basically. You mean like having missing a justice? <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, they don't like it, um, you know, for a couple of reasons. One is it just, it makes it difficult <coughs> to do what they're supposed to do. I mean, if you're always there with the, particularly when the court is so balanced as it is between, 
in a general sense, liberal and conservative viewpoints, the risk of four four split is very, very real. Uh, and so, you know, that's why I think they're going to be somewhat frustrated for the next several months, because why take a case that won't, won't be able to resolve? And the ones that they had that were tough, they're starting to kick out as affirmed by equally divided <coughs> And they could set those forward for a re-argument, but I don't think they have any idea when they're going to have in mind. So that makes it very awkward uh, for them. And I also think, you know, it's a place where tradition is, is very important and seniority. And, you know, the first set of arguments after Scalia died, they draped his chair in black and nobody moved. Now for this session, everybody's moved to their new positions because they sit based on seniority. So he's gone, so that means Kennedy moves, Thomas moves, they all move back and forth. And it, I, I, they won't like sitting there for every oral argument with an empty chair or going to the conference table and having an empty chair every conference they have. Uh, you know, it, it's a very personal dynamic. And my old boss, Justice White, used to say, every time we get a new justice, it becomes a new court. So that, you know, it's such a small group and they work so closely together that one person changing just makes a difference in the dynamic. And now they're kind of in a, a Netherland dynamic where they don't even know who that one person is going to be. I mean, I would say that, you know, I, I'm on the wrong side in terms of what's going to happen on both issues. I think they should confirm a, or a successor immediately. But I also thought Scalia's vote should have counted. I have a strong bias towards efficiency and not having a vacuum that prevents law from developing. Because our litigation system's already so slow that, you know, and it's interesting at the lower courts, um, you know, you'll often have an opinion where a judge died or had to recuse themselves late. And, you know, I have a database that includes every opinion from January 1st, 1980 till the present. And it's remarkable. The number of two judge panels, do you know how many split 1-1? One, one? Almost none. Now, admittedly, we have unanimous decisions there, but generally there's a respect for the vote of the judge who died. And, we tend to think that whoever was, you know, would switch, right? You know, they would just make it a 2-0 to favor that opinion because there's a desire to move on, have finality, do not have the case re-argued. And I think that there's, you know, one of the, th this is a horrible time for the court in terms of its legitimacy and the, the ability to resolve all these circuit splits, all these issues. I mean, their docket's so small and they handle so few cases. We're basically just throwing away uh, a year, and for that reason, I mean, I also think, you know, Scalia's votes can count, right? You don't have to say he joined an opinion, he just joined in the result. Uh, but, you know, the courts become so politicized and <coughs> so focused on it basically as a political body that neither view is being seriously entertained right now, and I think that's unfortunate. Yeah, and I would agree, because the, the case I argued, the firm 4-4, four, four, and we won below, so we still win, but I know he, I had his vote, so I wish he'd count. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, Nick? So uh, I'm a Kansas transplant, uh, but I've noticed that uh, y'all state has a little bit of a tip going between uh, the Supreme Court and the legislature, and that seems to put the legitimacy of both in question. I know, Professor, you just mentioned the legitimacy of the court at time. Do you think the ongoing politicism between the parties fighting about the nomination of the court and people who move on will put both sides legitimacy in question? I don't know if you can comment, but I, I can comment also as a transplant. I mean, it, it's been baffling to me, right, that I came here and to see such a dysfunctional state government combined with a dispute that's been going on for so long. Um, and it's it's been, you know, I, I've read, you know, because of course one of the, the, the differences between the federal and the state system is state constitutions get amended all the time, right? Some states do it way too often. Some states box themselves into a corner like California um, by not being able to raise taxes but having an excessive referendum system. And what's crazy is, is that this dispute stems from a state constitutional revision that is amendable. Uh, but that's not what's happened, and it's turned into a really weird fight. Now we're bringing in impeachment issues. I mean, it is um, something that I don't think reflects, I mean, admittedly, I, I think it reflects worse in the legislature, but that may be my own biases. But it's also because I, I generally have a greater respect for courts when they are independent. And I do think threats to independence are really big deals. And this is, I mean, you know, if this were happening in New York, it would be the front page of CNN on a regular basis. It's easy for the rest of the country to literally overlook flyover country. And, uh, but I do think that this is something, you know, the separation of powers problem has been here since the country's founding. And we're just kind of, it is a state in an extreme level of discord and the types of threats and defunding and all that going on is, is remarkable. And it, it makes almost like the disputes at the federal level seem 
minor in some ways. We're, we're more heated and more long term in terms of the dispute. Yeah, I, I mean, I agree that independent courts are important uh, and, you know, passing a statute that says we can impeach if a justice crosses the street other than in the crosswalk or whatever, you know, that, that sort of goes beyond what is probably appropriate. On the other hand, I think there are some legitimate concerns, and let me give you two examples. So, the big one is school finance, and of course I've argued these cases with no point bias, I represent the state, but you take a very big provision and have a court turn it into a several hundred million to a billion dollar obligation of the state, what do you expect the legislature to react? How are they going to react to that? I mean, and who told the court they get to take a big provision and impose those kind of obligations on the state? It's kind of like, you know, Scalia would say, why are nine of us ruling 320, and actually only five of us are ruling 320 million Americans that can make an argument why are a minimum of four Kansas Supreme Court justices ruling the entire state in certain ways. So there is an argument there. Uh, and the other thing is our court has not helped itself as much as it could. I'm talking about the Kansas Supreme Court. It's ridiculously slow to take care of cases. Uh, just to get them asking them to review a case, you can wait months to years to find out if they're even going to hear your case. I talked to a lawyer yesterday has a case that's been waiting three years just to see if they're even going to hear it. Uh, you know, that's ridiculous, certainly compared to the federal system. Uh, when you do argue in front of them, you may wait years to get an opinion. That doesn't happen in the Supreme Court or the circuits, typically. Uh, and some of their reasoning has been, I would say, not, I guess I, I would question it, and I'll give you this example. So in the car cases that recently the Kansas Supreme Court said their death sentences are invalid for various reasons, uh, and we're overturning them. We took that to the U.S. Supreme Court because the reasons were all allegedly federal constitutional defects. Uh, went to the Supreme Court, argued that case, and eight to one with Scalia writing, it's his final majority opinion. Uh, he says, this is nuts. Uh, you know, why, these arguments are just not even remotely plausible, basically. Uh, and an oral argument, what came through and what sort of comes through in the opinion, Scalia and the Chief maybe and Alito were saying, why is the Kansas Supreme Court blaming this on the U.S. Constitution? The U.S. Constitution does not require the overturning of these death sentences. If they want to overturn them, step up and say it's under the state constitution where you take responsibility for what you're doing. So there's a, you know, there is a sense that they have tried at times to avoid responsibility for a decision they want to reach. So, you know, I, I think both sides are guilty of some mistakes here. Uh, I don't think, believe me, I didn't want to stand up there and argue that if you don't rule in the state's favor on one issue, you lose your whole budget. I'm not sure that's the appropriate way for the legislature to respond. Uh, but you know, there, there are some legitimate questions about our court and the way it operates and the way it is handled at least some cases, I think. Ryan, did you have Sure. On that same line about legitimacy of the courts, what do you think that the current uh, current state of affairs with Judge Trump about getting any type of hearing, as well as just the how politicized the appointment process has become? What do you think that uh, how will that affect the Supreme Court in the future as far as legitimacy goes? I mean, I think all our I mean, you know, all of our federal government. 